How can we be out of sweet tea? Well, come on. Come on, dissolve already. Okay, this is not the way. Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about solvation and factors of solvation. And to explain solvation, I'll put it this way. Solvation, if you have a solute going into a solvent and you want that solute to dissolve, solvation is the act of separating solute particles and surrounding them with solvent particles. Okay? So, to kind of show an example of this, I've got a drawing of sodium chloride up here. It's a fantastic drawing. A drawing of sodium chloride and to represent sodium ions, we have these, these positives, okay? And to represent the chloride ions, we have the negatives. So what happens is, as this gets put into water, the molecules of water actually have a higher attractiveness to those sodium and chloride particles, respectively. So what happens then is, Chlorides will break off of this main pack, and sodiums will break off of this main pack. And because of their attractive nature to these water molecules, so then the water molecules will arrange themselves surrounding, surrounding each of these particles. Now, notice something. Notice that I've drawn these water molecules in a certain way around the chlorides, and then in another way around the sodiums. That's because you have to remember that these water molecules have polarity. And recall that for a polar molecule, <clears throat> you have a side, you have an end that's slightly negative and an end that's slightly positive. All right? Same goes with these. Slightly negative end here, slightly positive end here. Why? Because the oxygen is actually more electronegative which means that the electrons bonding between the oxygen and the hydrogen are going to be drawn a little bit more toward the oxygen than the hydrogen. This kind of causes that electron density to pool around the oxygen. And so because of that, we say that that end of the molecule is slightly negative feeling because of that extra electron density. So because of that, they'll arrange themselves with the slightly positive ends toward this negative chloride ion. And with the sodium, the slightly negative end oxygen will be arranged more closely to the sodium, the positive sodium ion. You get it? So that's how it works with an ionic compound. But what about molecular compounds? How do they dissolve? Well, I'm going to take you to the other board to show you that. Okay, so here we have a drawing of a sucrose molecule. Now, the, the black that you see that's the sucrose molecule. Pretty big. Your typical table sugar molecule, okay? Or at least it looks big to us. So how do they dissolve? Well, again, there's attractive forces between the water molecules and the sucrose molecule. Why? Because of all of these OHs, these hydroxides, on the sucrose molecule. You see all those? And so then the water comes along and it begins to hydrogen bond with those. You see that, where you've got oxygen here, and it's attracted to this slightly positive hydrogen, slightly negative oxygen, slightly positive hydrogen. So the hydrogen is attracted to this oxygen, oxygen is attracted to the hydrogen, and it happens that way all over, all over this sucrose molecule. And so because of that, you have, again, separating and surrounding. Now, 
the sucrose molecule, because it's covalent, it doesn't dissociate. It doesn't break apart completely like the sodium and the chloride did. Again, because it's covalent. But nonetheless, nonetheless, we have this hydrogen bonding that takes place and this separating from molecule to molecule and surrounding by these water, water molecules. Okay? So, these particles are surrounded. They're separated because of these attractive forces, and then they're surrounded because of the attractive forces again. Which brings up an important point, and that is that we have a phrase, like dissolves like. This is the reason, by the way, why oil and water don't really mix. Because oil is nonpolar. Water is polar. So because of that, water has we'll say an electron density imbalance, which gives it a slightly positive end, slightly negative end. Oil does not have that. Oil is more evenly distributed in its electron density, and so because of that, there's very little in the way of attractive force between water and oil. So that's why it doesn't really dissolve. So, what's important here is that there is an attraction involved here, an attractive force to pull these, these particles away from the block and to be surrounded by the water. When we have a solute going into a solvent, there are certain energy forces that have to be either overcome or added to this. For example, the solvent, the energy between, the attractive forces between solvent particles has to be overcome. And then the energy between the solute particles has to be overcome as well. So there's energy that goes into that. If you separate my hands, we talk about having to add energy to do that. But then, when the surrounding takes place, well, in that case, you have energy being given off. And so solvent particles are surrounding solute particles, being attracted to them in that way. So there's a combination there of energy going into it, the separating of the solvent particles and the solute particles from each other, and then as those solvent solute particles meet, there's energy that's given off. The combined energy is what we call the heat of solution. By the way, sometimes, sometimes that heat of solution is exothermic. In other words, the overall energy that comes out of mixing those things together is actually greater than what you put in. And then other times, it's endothermic where there's more energy that you put into it to break apart solute-solute bonds and solvent-solvent bonds, that's greater than the energy that comes from solute-solvent coming together. It's crazy, right? I mean, so let's talk about some factors that increase solvation. And really, common sense will tell you these things, but let's just point them out nonetheless. All right, for example, which is going to be better if I take cubed sugar and drop it in, or if I take sugar that's granulated, which one is going to dissolve more easily? Right, of course, it's going to be the granulated sugar, this one, this one right here, okay? The cubed sugar's over here, see the cubes? There we go, and the granulated sugar right here it's going to take less time for the granulated sugar to dissolve than the cube sugar. Why? Because of surface area. Now, going back to our diagrams, it's easier for those water molecules to uh, surround when it's easier to separate. And if there's a big block, a big block of particles that have to be separated, that takes more energy than smaller blocks or smaller areas where the water molecules can uh, be attracted to more areas on, on that sugar, for example. So, surface area is one way that we can increase solvation. Let's look at two more. Here's another way. Over here, I have this beaker on my magnetic stir. Over here, this one obviously is just sitting by itself. If I pour sugar into both of these, which one is more likely to dissolve first? 
Of course, yes. The one that's being stirred. So we would say that the more you agitate the mixture, the more solvation you can have. So over here on this side, this one will dissolve first because it's being agitated. The third factor is temperature. By increasing the temperature, I can put more solute into a solvent. So we have surface area, we have agitation, and we have temperature is our three factors of solvation. Now, I want to illustrate another concept to you, and that is the concept of saturation. Over here, I have room temperature, unsweet tea, and if I pour some sugar into this unsweet tea, I'll be able to get a certain amount, a certain amount before I can't mix any more into that unsweet tea. We call that saturation. The point at which as much solute is crystallizing back out again as solute that's dissolving. It's equal rates of both. So that's saturation. Anything less than that amount, I would have unsaturation. In other words, I can still fit more solute into my solvent. But if I increase the temperature dramatically, I can actually put a whole lot more solute into that solvent. So much so that I can put even more in than I would have been able to at this room temperature T. Now, I can get to the point even with this, even with this boiling T to where I can't get any more, any more solute in, any more sugar in but it will be vastly more than what I can get into here. So when we increase the temperature dramatically and we're able to fit more solute into that solvent than what we could at room temperature, that's what we call super saturation. And the way that we notice this is, if I keep putting more of this in there, if I were to mix this up until again, until even I couldn't get any more sugar into this tea, if I took this tea off the hot plate and allowed it to begin cooling, at a certain point in time, crystallization would start occurring. Why? Because there's more solute that can fit into that solution, we'll say it that way, than could be when it was boiling hot. So again, Right now, this tea over here is super saturated, okay? This tea over here might just be saturated. You get it? Okay, time to take this tea off the hot plate so we can move on to one of our last concepts. So that ability of a solute to dissolve into a solvent is what we call its solubility. How well will it dissolve into that solvent? And there's a lot of factors involved. It has to do with the nature of the solute, the nature of the solvent, how many collisions there are between solute particles and solvent particles such that there can be attractive enough forces to pull the solute particles away from each other so that they can meet up with a solvent. All these things go into it, but that is the measure of solubility. Now, uh, sometimes you can have solute particles that are in solution, and if there's enough of them in solution, then they begin colliding with each other, and sometimes they will recrystallize. So you might have some that go into the solution, they dissolve well, they collide with solvent particles, and those solute solvent particles collide, and they're attracted to one another, and the solvent particles surround the solute particles, and that would be dissolving. So you can have dissolving, but you can also have crystallization if you get too many solute particles into play. And this gives us our concept of saturation. Now it's interesting to note that gases are soluble as well. Gases can be soluble in liquids, but what we find is that the higher the temperature, the less soluble the gas is. Interesting. But the reason is because as the kinetic energy gets higher in that liquid,
for a gas, it's real easy to get some more kinetic energy and to leave the system. So the higher the temperature, the higher the kinetic energy, and the easier it is for that gas to leave the system. Thus, it becomes less soluble. Now, we also see that external pressure applied to a gas and into a liquid causes the solubility of that gas to increase. It's able to solubilize more into that solvent. We see this every day, don't we? We put carbon dioxide into water and we pressurize it to keep that carbon dioxide in the water. Whenever you open a bottle of Coke, then you hear the whoosh. As the pressure decreases, the solubility of that carbon dioxide decreases as well. It begins to bubble out. This relationship, this direct relationship between solubility and pressure can be expressed in what we call Henry's Law. And Henry's Law tells us that an original solubility at an original pressure is equal to a final solubility at a final pressure. So if you change the pressure, you'll change the solubility as well. And we can solve problems this way, problems of solubility, with Henry's Law. Okay, let's use an example of Henry's Law. And let's say that we have 0.85 grams per liter solubility. This is equal to our solubility here. And it's at four atmospheres. So we're able to get 0.85 grams of a gas into one liter of liquid at four atmospheres of pressure. What will happen to that solubility if we reduce the pressure to one atmosphere? Okay, so we'll solve over here. So S1 over P1 equals, whoops, S2 over P2. So we have our S1.85 over P1, which is four atmospheres. And that's equal to, we're going to solve for S2, solve for our new solubility at a pressure, I'll get it, of one atmosphere. All right, so we can solve for this. S2 is equal to 0.85 times one over four cross multiply here, and so S2 equals about 0.21 grams per liter. So that shows us just what we've been thinking, that the less pressure you have, the less soluble a gas will be. So I hope this has been helpful to you today, talking about solvation and how solute particles are separated from each other, solvent particles are separated from each other, and then solute particles are surrounded by solvent particles. And how we talked about three factors that will affect solvation. The surface area, how you agitate it, and if you increase the temperature. Increasing any of those will increase your solvation. And then we also talked about unsaturated, saturated, and supersaturated. And then finally we talked about Henry's Law and how solubility is directly related to external pressure. Again, I hope this was helpful to you, and I hope to see you guys really, really soon. Until then, God bless. Cheers. Oh, oh, super saturated. Wow. Mm.